Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Coming Dovey podcast. I am Christopher Beljanovsky, and joining me in the virtual podcasting booth once again is the man, the myth, the legend, Toasty. So glad to have you back. Oh, man, it's, it's great to be back. Toasty! If you've been with us for a while, we really appreciate your support. And if you're new here, welcome, and be sure to hit follow or subscribe for more great content. Either way, be sure to tell a friend, as it really helps us out. Greetings, combatants. Uh, to begin, I just want to say uh, once again, it's it's a it's a real pleasure to be back here. Um, if you notice, my voice isn't a hundred percent. Yeah, I am a little congested. I was I'm currently recovering from uh, from an illness, uh, but I've come a long way. Before I could not talk, and I sounded like something horrifying. But uh, luckily, I have most of my voice back, albeit with a small cough. So bear with me here. I'm going to try my best. We are human and we're trying to get things done here. <laughs> so that being said, today we will be joined alongside Catalin Rodriguez Ogren. Some of you may be more familiar with the name Catalin Zamiar. Regardless, she is best known as the original, the ever so breathtaking Kitana. Over 10,000 years of preserved Adenian beauty and talent, Kitana continues to live on with diehard fans to this day. Tur um, the Turcotan ferocious Melina she also portrayed. Uh, a colored altered sprite was also used meanwhile to create the mysterious Jade character. Catalan truly is a real-life combatant, whether she's wielding fans, size, uh, or the staff. She is a master of her craft and continues to practice and educate people to this day. We have a lot of questions in store, and we will now kick off with this interview. Well, hello, hello. We are joined here by Catalan, the original Kitana, also portrayed Melina and Jade. Thank you so much for being here today, Catalan. Thanks for having us, uh, all my characters on, all my personalities. <laughs> uh, perhaps to begin, why don't you tell us about some of your extensive martial arts background uh, back then and now, and uh, how you originally received the role of uh, Kitana in Mortal Kombat 2? Well, I started as um, a karate student when I was nine. So I started studying martial arts when I was very young. Um, I also was doing ballet and gymnastics, like, you know, okay. a lot of young girls at that time. So I had a really good, I think, natural aptitude for movement, choreography. Um, I was very flexible. I had a little spring in my step, you know, due to being a dancer and taking gymnastics as well. So over the course of my life, I've been able to study a lot of martial arts. So I kind of equate it to a musician starting with an instrument. And over the course of their life, you just get better and better at hearing music, learning music, reading music, writing music, and you just pick up instruments along the way. So that's kind of what my martial arts career has been like. And while I certainly haven't mastered every martial art that I've ever done, you know, I have been able to get four black belts over the course of um, all my training and certainly have natural, a natural aptitude for some more than others, just like a musician would. Even though I've done karate the yeah. longest, I'm probably not as, it's probably not the one I'm the most naturally talented at, even though I've technically done it longer. I think kind okay. of just like a musician, like you kind of find a stride where you not only find a genre that you like, but you find an instrument that you like, you kind of bounce around from one to the other. And that's kind of been my martial arts career. Okay. Interesting. So uh, how much of Katana's and Melina's backstory was established um, upon accepting the role? And uh, did you enjoy... Yeah looking at the various concepts that uh, John Tobias shared with you at the time? I mean, first of all, you know, when I first met John and the game concept 
was described to me, I was still kind of wrapping my mind around it because it was so new at the time. And even though I played games, I was not a fight game um, person. So I was, you know, more in the Galaga. I was, I loved Rampage. You know, there were these other games that I was really uh, very into, you know. Um, there was one called... Uh, uh, Dungeons and Dragons that I was really into, you know, like really simple, like highly pixelated little characters, but I, I was not a street fighter fan. And, um, okay. but my brothers were huge Mortal Kombat fans. So I was able to kind of get a sense of really what it was. Uh, once I kind of put it all together, you know, John really came to me, um, after Danny had introduced us with, really what he wanted as a concept for the character, but didn't really know what direction it was going to be. Uh, and what I mean okay. is like the weapons, like the weapons were my weapons, you know? So as we talked through some of the characters uh, capabilities and what they wanted, you know, there were things that I presented because that's what I could do. Um, and then there were weapons that just weren't practical. Like a staff wasn't practical on the set. Mm. Um, you know, a sword wasn't super, actually, I don't remember why we didn't do sword, but once they saw fan, fan was just cool. And the size were actually my oh, yeah. competition weapon of choice. So that's oh. where that kind of came into play. Yeah. So, so that's yeah, where, you're... you know, the character's development had a lot of infusion from kind of who I was as a martial artist at that moment yeah. in time. And uh, the same, you know, goes with like Danny and the other guys that they infused a lot of who they were as a practitioner at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it would stand to reason that you sort of uh, were involved in, in some of the creative process uh, for these characters. Um, so not only the signature weapons, but um, is there anything else by chance, any key elements to the character that you can recall you sort of helped mold into place? Oh, I mean, I think without a doubt, we've all influenced the friendship and fatalities. I mean, those were not scripted yeah. at all. Those were so in the moment. <laughs> I didn't come to shoot that okay. day and even have any idea of those, you know, um, those movements. We just, in the moment, you know, I was prompted. I was prompted by... Danny and John. Uh, Danny did a lot of the prompting because he had filmed several characters and he had also seen what John could do and couldn't do. So when they were directing us right. to do movement, and I would say, well, what about this? He, you know, Danny would already go, that's cool, but no, the, it, we can't capture it. It'll never work. It's too fast. Because a lot of it had to be, could we take the movement and slow it down enough for it to be captured and then broken down and look good? And Danny had already tried a bunch of things that I think didn't work out that probably John okay. told him that just didn't work out. So uh, when we did a lot of the jumping and the spinning movements, that was something that we had to be able to do in a slower pace or tempo um same thing like front walk like a front walk over back walk over those were easier than like a handspring so like we defaulted to that because i could control how slow i did it or how fast i did it but for Do sure friendships to... and fatalities we yeah <laughs> Do you happen to remember any we have a little moves delay, I think. off the top of your head? Yeah. Yeah, you, I mean, uh, happen to remember cake, any moves that you did that you didn't make the it? bones out. Oh, moves that okay. didn't make it. Um, <laughs> yeah. Moves that didn't make it. I mean, I, I feel like I did a handspring, and we just knew that wasn't going to work out. Um, I huh. think I did a spin heel kick, but I think Luke Kang did that, and they like filmed it, but they didn't use it. Um, from, from what oh. I remember. And then there were kicks that we all mm. did. Like we all did a version of a sidekick, a version of a sweep, a high kick, a high yes. punch, a low, you know, all those were, were state, you know, static, um, common movements that we all did based on the joystick configurations. But yeah. there were mostly like spin and 
some of the more acrobatic stuff. Like even when, you know, Hosung did his bicycle kick, he couldn't actually jump up and do that. We had to stage that. <laughs> that had to be prompted up on, um, it was actually a, a platform so that he could do it because it was one of those things that he had to do at the peak of his job and the only way to pull it off would be to do it quickly, right? So yeah. there were things that we just weren't able to do for that reason, especially when you really knew, if you really know how much we could do at that time, you know, in the peak of being in our twenties and so young and athletic and, you know, really not even at the peak of our capabilities, but almost at the peak of our capabilities. Like we were all, you know, Tony was super athletic. Hosung was super athletic. Yeah. You know, I, I could still pull off like aerials and things like that back then, but they couldn't capture that. Right. Oh, it was an aerial, so I think, a... that we tried, and it didn't work out. Oh, okay. Okay. Intriguing. Um, we've got a question from one of our followers. So Simon Davies asks, do you have a website where fans can order an autographed photo from you? And uh, during production, uh, the production of Mortal Kombat 2, did you ever think uh, the game would explode like it did and that the franchise would continue <clears throat> to be this popular 30 years later? I, I, I don't think I could say that I did. I mean, obviously, I think things would have turned out differently if we had an idea that we were going to be part of something so grand and have a legacy that would last as long as it has. Um, you know, despite the fact that, you know, we, well, I can only speak for me, um, that there wasn't really a fair compensation once they knew the game was going to make billions of dollars, kind of that typical, you know, story of like, you know, why, why leave the people out? Just be, you know, just because you can't doesn't mean you should kind of thing. Um, yeah. you know, they, they, they could have just, uh, been part, they just could have been just, sometimes people just can be better and they just weren't. That's all, you know? So Absolutely. despite all that, I wouldn't change my involvement and the relationships that I built with my, my castmates. I mean, Danny and I have been friends for a long time, Philip and I, so I'm closest to Danny and Philip, but at the end of the day, yeah. you know, Tony and I both have businesses here in the city. Um, you know, I, hmm. I would do anything to support him keeping his martial arts school open. I, I think he would do the same for me. Hosung and I had a very close relationship for a very, very long time. Uh, and then I'm friends with a bunch of other people because of this thing that kind of ties us together. And that's cool. Uh, I don't think I really started to fully appreciate everything until I had kids. You know, you kind of go off and you have your own trajectory of your career and your life yeah. and the things that you're going to do. And, you know, I got to a point where like video games were not really important to me anymore, like in my late twenties and my thirties and stuff like that. But sure. then I had kids and my kids are gamers. Um, and it was really cool to kind of bring them into the fold with a couple of the fan events. Mm hmm. Uh, is there anywhere, um, that people can uh, purchase an autograph from you, Catalan? Yeah, maybe I don't, you know, I'm working on really sizing up how important doing something like that is. You know, I've done events, uh, several of, uh, fan events with Danny and C2E2 and, um, this amazing, uh, arcade in Nashville called Game Terminal that are fan events that yeah. we do bring the autographs and the photos and stuff like that. So I think that is something that in the future I would for sure add to the Instagram handle, which is um, Catalan Mortal, uh, Catalan MK Original is the actual handle. Uh, I know some of my castmates have started to do that, so I think I just need to kind of copy what they're doing and start <laughs> offering that, yeah. Excellent, excellent. Did you keep any of the um, props or, or any trinkets from set? Uh, do you have the costume? Also, if I were to ask you what your absolute favorite memory of working on Mortal Kombat 2 is, what would that be? 
honestly, we laughed so much the day that we filmed. I mean, it was, I can't even describe the amount of fun it was <laughs> as a martial artist to be able to do something like this at the time. In a way, it was kind of like just for fun. You know, I don't think any of us sure. took the job to do these characters thinking, you know what, this is going to launch my career as an actor. I mean, I do know that some of the characters obviously, or some of the castmates, they wanted to be actors or they were models. Like Carrie was a model, you know, uh, Leah is a model. Yeah. The, the girl, those two were models. Yep. So this was, you know, something that could help their modeling career, you know, uh, Danny was doing stunt work. You know, obviously Ho Sung had a career in uh, as a martial arts actor. But for me, it was like, I mean, can you think of something cooler to do when martial arts is your life and you love it? And, you know, <laughs> you, I mean, I still do it every single day. So, I mean, you know, hmm. o almost every single day. So martial arts is still a huge part of my life. Um, you know, 41 years later, I'm still doing martial arts. So uh, I, you know, that whole day, there isn't one movement. I think, I mean, I don't know, just all of it, like all of it was just so much fun. The failures were fun yeah. doing things and it just <laughs> not being right, you know, <laughs> was fun. I can but only all imagine. the training that came I, out of it afterwards, you know, like after that all happened, we all started to train together all the time. Oh, brilliant. You know, yeah. I trained with Danny and Ho Sung and Ho Sung's brother and Tony, um, like, I don't know, three to five days a week, but for years, you know? Wow. That that's kind of cool. Wow. I mean, I trained the most with Ho oh, Sung, um, but Danny was still a huge influence on me. He was older than me, um, so he, you know, Danny was really kind of the one that got me into kung fu. So that was kind of mm. cool. I stuck with it easily because Ho Sung became my my one of my instructors for kung fu. But by the time I had started kung fu, I already had three black belts. Mm. So it was really Danny who had said something um, to me, uh, which is the reason why I even opened my mind to doing Kung Fu because at that time I was like, ah, I want to do the fighting sports, you know, like I was like kind of done with traditional martial arts. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, he had just said, you know, you were never meant to be a hard stylist. You should have been a soft stylist all along. I said, what do you mean? He's like, you don't move like a hard stylist. You make karate look soft. And he wasn't meaning soft mm. as in weak. He just meant soft as no, in like no. the way, because, you know, styles are div divided, not exactly, but like there's hard and soft styles of practice. And then there's circular movements and linear movements. So whatever, without getting into like, kind of like the dissection and dichotomy of martial arts lineage, I had just kind of never really thought of that. And really, you know, it kind of comes down to, somebody really saying something that makes you feel like you could be really good at something. And mm -hmm. I was like, huh, okay. And I tried it and I wouldn't say Kung Fu was easy, but it came easy because I had this dance background and the movements were just so fluid and I just, I just fell in love with it. And then obviously watching, you know, people like Ho Sung, Danny and Tony at the time practice Kung Fu and Wushu, I was like, why did I not start this earlier? Because it's very <laughs> acrobatic. Sure. So those are memories that to me are some of the best outcomes from Mortal Kombat. Because I would have never mm -hmm. even started probably or tried Kung Fu or Wushu for that matter. Wow, that's something to think about. Did you happen to keep anything from the set? No, but I have my weapons from the game because they were my weapons. They weren't, they didn't belong to the game. <laughs> yeah. They were actually mine. So, yeah. That's right. That's cool. Um, for what I understand, many of the actors had difficulties during shooting 
Uh, not with the moves themselves, uh, because you're all highly skilled, but basically just keeping their costumes on and intact. Um, yeah. Is it true that oh, yeah. your leggings were bands. rather slippery and your face mask uh, yeah. was actually taped to your nose? Yes, they had to tape it to my nose. <laughs> wow. And then my leggings were like <laughs> basically a satin sock that looked like a, a boot. But then when you start moving, the okay. satin doesn't like hold its shape and form. So it would kind of stretch out. Kind of like when you buy the costumes today from, you know, uh, Spirit Halloween or something. So I had rubber bands <laughs> that held it up to to keep them from falling. And that was the other thing. Like when huh. you were throwing like spin kicks and kicks with a satin sock, you pivot very quickly. So slowing things down in the satin sock was really, really hard for me. Whereas I will say, Danny, I think... Danny, Hosung, and Tony, they all had a Kung Fu shoe on. So they had always worked yeah. in a Kung Fu shoe and therefore could could control their spin tempo and their kick speed. I remember just being like, whoa, like every time I did something, it was just <laughs> very fast and it was really hard to control it. Yeah. Catelyn, is it true that... Um you and Ho Sung Pak were actually dating during the production of Mortal Kombat 2? No, we dated after the production. Actually, maybe started after. dating six months, six or nine months, maybe after. Okay. I just found that, okay, well, it's good to know, because initially I thought it was during production, and I found that kind of funny of, of a coincidence, because later in the franchise, uh, Kitana and Liu Kang develop a of love interest, Of course, they get right? together. So, yeah. <laughs> right. uh, did, did John yeah, we, Tobias we ever see this working concept out. with you? Uh, no. So, obviously, the characters um, were... So... We were both in the game, but we shot at completely different times. We were on, I mean, we never intercepted when we were in the game or when we were filming. Right. Then we started to hang out at the, the health club together and we started to honestly work out together. Hold on a second. And we, uh, so we started to work out together. Uh, we started lifting weights and then practicing. Like I started to, you know, do a little Kung Fu and things like that. And then we actually started to, believe it or not, um, play basketball together. I know oh, that's random. my favorite oh, yeah. sport. Uh, cause Hosung <laughs> was just a, a, a die hard basketball fan. Okay. But well, when okay. you, when you add all those encounters and then, Hey, everybody's going to go get something to eat. And then it became like, okay, Danny's getting off at 10 o'clock. Anybody want to go eat? You know, like you got nothing but energy at that age, you know, in your 20s. So then we just all started to go eat together a couple times a week. Um, and it just became very social. And then as we started to train and work out together more and more, then we started dating. So I, I want to yeah. say it was maybe six or nine, six or nine months maybe after, I think. Okay. With anything that's around for a long time, um, there's always an offshoot. There's comic books, there's movies, there's TV shows, and Mortal Kombat obviously um, falls into that category too. So, um, over the years, have you ever, you know, watched any of the movies or anything like that? And how do you feel about um, the way that your various characters have been portrayed in those? Um, the first movie, I'll be honest, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't very good. I think everybody kind of agrees with that. Um, I don't really have an opinion about how that character was portrayed. Uh, I mean, it was fine. The last movie was good though. I thought the recent film, I can't really imagine them doing much better with it. Like what more could they do? I mean, it's a, it's a Mortal Kombat storyline, you know what I mean? Um, I think they did a great job of keeping it funny, uh, keeping it uh, oh. fan <laughs> driven. Um, yeah. You know, were there some castings that maybe, you know, people don't agree with? 
I mean, it, it wasn't my character. Obviously, I'm very excited to see what happens with Katana. I think she's going to be in the next film from what mm. I've seen. Mm. Um, Most likely. I didn't have a problem with Melina's. Yeah, I didn't have a problem with Melina's character at all. I thought she was evil enough, I guess, if that makes sense. Uh <laughs> Could sure. there have been a better representation of Melina's true movements? Yeah, probably. But who knows if that was her bringing her character and her personality or the choreography. You know, I don't know. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, I think it would have been cool if the character had maybe a, a few more uh, movements that were really more of a Melina movement literacy i guess is what i'm trying to say like her actual movement pattern yeah but it was a good movie it totally surprised me oh it was super fun I. it was exactly what it needed to be in my opinion yeah i think so yeah i mean all all of the other people who've worked on the on the games in the past when we've spoken to them generally all of them love the movie as well because like you said it's you know a lot of the things are so true to the games you know they brought that sort of gory aspect to it as well and you know you got to start somewhere mm-hmm. so you know the story's just beginning a lot of people didn't like how it was sort of simple i guess but uh, you know i really think it's going to expand and it's going to become something very special so We have a submission from Zachariah Robert Clark. He asks, do you ever actually play Mortal Kombat as your character? Uh, And lastly, what are your thoughts on the evolution of your character uh, throughout recent games? I don't play Mortal Kombat. Uh, I'm sorry to say I'm still not a fight game person, believe it or not. (laughs) Um... I don't I don't love the way the character has changed. I think it's a little gratuitous and a little forced. And honestly, I, I think it's a little unoriginal. Um, you know, to just take kind of an over graphic uh, style costume and just do it because that's what all kind of, I don't know, Barbarella-ish type female icons have to be portrayed at some point. I don't really think it's necessary. Um, I think, you know, more is not better. And I think they did that with the female characters. Um, My impression is that they did that to make it further from the original intentionally. Mm -hmm. So there's really like no association whatsoever by making it so not lifelike it's therefore further from the original characters and the way in which they were developed uh that's my first thought uh, my second is that it okay. probably matched what was happening at the time being demanded by uh you know the industry and the fan base uh while i'm not a huge game you know fight game person you know I do follow comic books and I know with graphic novels and stuff like that, illustration style became and has become extremely graphic and over the top and unlike life. I think the shame in all that is what really made the game famous was that it was life like, not life like in action, but life like in movement and life like in character. Right. So the very yeah. essence of what really made one element obviously john's storyline and ed's they made the game amazing for sure you can't move away from the fact that the characters were part of that recipe and while everyone can speculate that it had nothing to do with us and they could have done it all with models i think most people would agree that if they hired only models for all the characters the game would not have been real the movements would not have looked oh, real. Highly agreed. Um, and and I have nothing against all the characters who are um, models and uh, or, or dancers, but they don't look like us when we punch and kick. They don't look like you know Danny 
or 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 me or or Hosang. I mean, you can tell which characters are martial artists. Now, with that、oh, being、yeah. said, some of the characters don't need to be martial artists, right? But if they were all not martial artists, how would it be a martial arts fighting game? Does that make sense? You know, <laughs> that's, a, that's like、thing. Jax is that's not、exactly. supposed to necessarily be a martial artist. He's a combat martial combat, right? He's a combat guy. He's、mm-hmm. a militia guy. So his movements yeah, sure, reflect yeah. that. But and I, I think that's something that really is not said enough. That if you would have just made it a bunch of characters that were models and over the top with, you know, just covering from the nipples down to the belly button, up the back, you know, like the the clothes are just so crazy and over the top, you know, that was like Danny's body, that was Hosung's body, that was Phil's body. I mean, yeah, that's yeah. what's kind、yeah. of cool is they actually looked like that,、yep. and I think that's a little neater.、Mm-hmm. Like they didn't change the way our bodies look. They didn't add muscles. They didn't add boobs. They didn't add butt or calves or you know. I think that's what makes it cooler. That's my opinion. But I get it that、well、things、said. have to adapt with what a genre, how a genre changes. And right now things are very gratuitous in general.、Uh, I'm just not a person that you know more is better. <laughs> So you mentioned, but they did、previously. something right because it's still here, right? That's it. <laughs> oh yeah, still doing well. <laughs> still here. So you mentioned that、um, you had a bunch of fun、um, on set with with everyone else.、Um, are there any particular practical jokes or fun times that you can remember specifically? <laughs> I mean, you know, just like little things like "Get over here" is kind of funny because you know it's 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 definitely overplayed <laughs> and oversaid. But like forever, whenever we're all together, you know how there's always someone who's a straggler, right? It's always get over here. So it's like it's hard not to chuckle with all these little、yeah. things that are are said, you know. And and now, kind of like phrases like "get over here" is just kind of part of the nomenclature in the gamer world and and stuff like this, that. So I think that is always. Gonna work its way into the conversation. I, I don't, I don't know how how else to put it, but I will say that you know, like we were just in Nashville earlier, well, last year, several of us, and I mean, we still laugh a ton, you know. And for me, Danny's always the ringleader who kind of keeps us together <laughs> and seems to have the lowdown on things, and he was kind of the ringleader back then. Um,、mm. and I don't know. I there's not just one thing. It, it's more just kind of like leaving off, starting where you left off. Which like always, when we see each other, the energy is just right where we left off, and that's amazing. No different.、Mm-hmm. That's amazing. I understand. Well, you mentioned earlier actually that your brothers are. Pretty big Mortal Kombat fans,、um, so they were, yeah. And this was even well, yeah.、Uh, what was their reaction when you told them that you were cast as、uh, a new princess character, Kitana? And have you guys ever played the game together? Oh yeah, of course. When we were younger, sure, we totally <laughs> did. But the the truth is that my my one brother was actually pitching me to Danny. Um,、oh. when Danny、wow. mentioned to him that they were looking to hire a female martial artist, so here here's a, a funny story. Danny's told it maybe once or twice. Okay, so Danny at the time worked at this health club. My mom, my, my mom and my brothers were members of the health club, Lakeshore Athletic Club. Okay, yes,、uh, that's where they would all get together and practice and work out and hang out. They're already there doing that. I graduated college. I moved back to Chicago. My mom's like, "Hey, I added you to the health club membership." I was like, "Great, okay." Before I was coming back, Mortal Kombat Two was already in production, and Danny, being just an unbelievably friendly person, he hit it off with my mom, who was a member, 
And they just became great chit chat yeah. friends because my mom was very, very yeah. outgoing and very talkative. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then my one brother, Alex, who was a huge Mortal Kombat fan and playing the game, and my mom would take him to play the game, knew Danny was in the game. Uh, and, and Tony and Hosung, but Danny was the one that was really friendly. He said, yeah, we're, we're going to be looking for new female characters or new, new females to play a game, the uh, play a character in the game. And my brother started to like pitch me and he's like, yeah, yeah, kid, whatever. You know, he's like a young tween teen talking about how, oh, my sister can do this. My sister can do this. And he's like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Then I kind of came to the club and it took a couple weeks, but it turns out Danny and I knew each other from our competition days. But remember, Danny's older than me. So when you're a teenager and you're a man in your 20s, you don't like go talk to a girl that's in high school. You know what I'm saying? Right. So at that time, because there, there was about a 10 year age difference between us, maybe eight or nine, something like that. Uh, it turns out that Danny eventually figured out who I was because he used to watch me compete because we would compete at the same events. <laughs> but be- because world. I was really a minor, he was over 21, there was no real interfacing, even though like we knew of each other because the co- competition scene and tournament scene small. So... It kind of all came around. Then they saw me working out when I was doing my own thing and I was training just on my own. And uh, that's when Danny finally approached me. He's like, did you used to, you know, compete on this circuit? Were you the one who, and then it kind of like all started to click. So it, it was actually a good thing that my brother had mentioned me to Danny because it kind of sparked, he may not have ever even, watched me when I was working out um, on this fourth floor where there was an open area to train. So that that's that. Wow. Uh, so, <laughs> honest question. When you did play Mortal Kombat with them back then, uh, did you always pick your own character? And who would your uh, brothers normally uh, <laughs> choose? Uh, my brother loved, uh, well, the Scor- Scorpion. Sub- when Sub-Zero came out, Sub-Zero was very... Um, this, uh, the, yeah, Scorpion Sub-Zero, I think he played Liu Kang too, every once in a while. Oh yeah. Um, but the Scorpion and Sub-Zero were just, I don't know if I would say they are the most popular. I feel like they're the most popular character. Oh yeah. Like everybody loves Scorpion and Sub-Zero. I feel like they are by far the most popular character in the game. And time, like. Pretty much. You know. I mean, there's not, you know, you don't see their faces, so that makes it easy for the franchise to keep them really out there. But, you know, they could be, um, they could be of another world because of the backstory on the character. Whereas, like, Katana couldn't really be of another world, you know, so to speak, with mystical, magical powers and an orb and, you know, that just wasn't her, her (laughs) MO, right? Her CV doesn't say that. Whereas, like, you know, <laughs> Sub-Zero and Scorpion just had this underlying mystical element always to them. Yeah. Uh, Diego James asks, after your work on Mortal Kombat 2, did you ever go on to lend your skills to other video games? Yes, I worked for Atari for a while. So Atari was testing technology, testing storylines, testing programming. Obviously, there was a game. They had a Jaguar system at the time that was going to launch some fighting games. So I worked for them uh, for uh, however many months, filming a bunch of different characters and working on... Well, I think they were working on just increasing the capture rate was one of the things, I, I, from what I remember, like one of the things they wanted to do was be able to capture more frames per uh, per minute or whatever so that there was more clarity in Christmas because it opened up a little bit of the things that we could do as characters as well. 
when you're talking about a character actually doing the real live action movements versus it becoming kind of animated. Does that make sense? Yeah. They wanted still that live action aspect and not do like what the animated base characters do. Like in Street mm -hmm. Fighter, where they can flip three times, but that's because people can't really flip, right? It was drawn. It was animated. Yeah. Uh, when the character, when the creators rather uh, initially told you about the secret Jade character, what were your thoughts mm -hmm. surrounding it? And uh, perhaps you can tell us how that process went. Um, I mean, it was really cool. I, I'll be honest. I, I don't think I understood what they meant by a secret character. Um, okay because I had never played a game that had something like that, you know? But um, I kept thinking it was like a character you played later, like you leveled up and then it became, oh. which is kind of, I guess, what happened, but or in a way that it came out later. So I didn't really understand what they meant by a secret character at the time. I mean, obviously, you know, I quickly figured it out once, you know, you saw it. But I wish that there was a little bit more planning into Jade because it would have been fun to have done another weapon for her. Mm. Yeah. If you had the choice, what weapon would you have uh, chosen? You know, I really like sword, but I think they... Um, I like sword and I really like staff, but staff was just so at the time staff was such a big weapon for the set. And from what I remember, the staff was something originally that they couldn't really capture. I'd have to double check with Danny because he would probably like spark my memory. But from, from what I remember, I, I feel like we couldn't do staff. And then there was the complication of the weapon being on the body. And, and even with like the size, like the size kind of appear and then disappear. So I'm sure, I'm sure John would remember too, Tobias, like why we didn't go with that. I, I know for sure size and fans were just cooler, without a doubt. They won on all, you know, cool factor. They were different, you know, uh, other games didn't really have them. Um, you know, that kind of a thing. But I don't remember why we didn't film like yeah. a weapon for Jade specifically. Okay. Okay. Um, tell us a little bit about uh, the Book of Swords movie you filmed with Rich DeVizio, Ho Sung, and Daniel Pacino. <laughs> yeah, so Book of Swords was... Um, so Ho Sung Pak uh, was very focused on uh, being a martial arts actor, right? And right at the tail of Mortal Kombat 2, uh, or in the middle of production, he got cast to be in a movie with Jackie Chan called Drunken Master 2. Um, and that was a huge um, opportunity for him. So oh, I yeah. think that between that and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, he had aspirations of writing a script and, or producing a film or whatever. So he ended up connecting with a guy that was um, another person we met through, believe it or not, Lakeshore Athletic Club, uh, who was a cameraman for um, a news station here called WGN. Uh, his name was Ike Isaacs. And he was just a great guy, okay. just an absolutely amazing human being. And he wanted to cross over from being a cameraman to being, you know, working on films. So... At that time, you know, Chicago was starting to have a, a bit of a film industry was was growing here. And I was just very good at like project management naturally. Just I, I, I was a very good task master, you know, very good at getting things done. So Ho Sung with uh, another writer, um, you know, they, they wrote a script called Book of Swords, and it was kind of like their childhood dream, Ho Song and Danny, um, that they would like be in a martial arts film together. Now, keep in mind, Danny um, and Rich were both foot soldiers in Teenage Mutant Ninja 
Colonels 2, I think, uh, that Ho Sung connected them for that gig. And my memory wow. of them talking about it is that it was like the greatest time in the world. Like, you know, <laughs> nothing was better than all of that. I had no aspirations of working in films. I uh, did not want to be an actor. Mm. I had my own course, my path that I was on. But all my friends, this was really important to them. And we all hung out. And once again, you know, go back to like when you're in your 20s, you've got nothing but energy. And <laughs> you're, you can just do. I just I wasn't lazy and I just had nothing but energy. I just, just was able to do more and more. So... Fast forward, the, the script gets built. We're maybe two years past Mortal Kombat now, maybe a couple, maybe it's 96, 97, I want to say. Okay. Um, and they got the funding for the film, uh, Ho Sung and a bunch of other producers, mm -hmm. uh, but they needed someone to assist with um, some of the production work, really all the crap work, um, you know, all the things that just kind of like fall through the cracks in a film like I was really good at just kind of being there for that but then the other element that was super fun for me was Ho Sung did uh did, did some of it but Ho Sung did you know the the fight scene choreography and we were dating at that time and who was his training partner so who got to just work through fight scene choreography me and he had also been on a tv show that was on Fox called um, Martial Arts World Masters or something. Uh, it was like a Fox Saturday morning live action show. And he would come back and he would work through fight scene choreography with me. And then he'd go back and work it out, obviously, with his actual choreographer. So then we had this yeah. like small little snippets of um, good workmanship you know um yeah when he was like no you need to do this i understood because obviously we were dating i understood what he wanted and so forth um fast forward to book of swords i helped with the fight scene choreography in that i was like a stand-in does that make sense i wasn't like the choreographer yeah. but i was like part of that team and the stand-in and no, 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 what if we do this? So let, let's say Ho Sung was there and Danny was there, but Rich wasn't there. They'd be like, okay, Kat, you do da you do Rich's part. I'd be like, okay. And that's just kind of like how it all worked. So I got to be part of the film in that capacity. Then they kind of came into this mm. scene where they're like, we need to have one scene that's this like homage to like Liu Kang and Katana kind of fighting. And that was this <laughs> one short little scene that was in a tunnel and there were a lot of things that went into it to it was a little overthought out in my opinion uh number one you know everybody thought it was going to look bad if ho sung's character beat my character because they were going to be like oh so you beat up your girlfriend in the movie and at the time like they were just reading too much into it, so they were all like really super sensitive about it and then on the flip side obviously my character couldn't beat Ho Sung's character because his character was the star and obviously then the movie would end. So my character became like this like figment of his imagination and I just disappeared. So while we filmed these fight scenes, like I had to, like there were all these things. And I mean, the truth is it was super fun. Um, and they wanted me to have the size so that it was once again an homage to the character that I played in the game. The problem was that I didn't know how to move the size because this was filmed now, so I could move fast. I didn't know how to move the size right. um, with props. The prop size that they gave me, which would obviously keep Ho Sung safe if I accidentally hit him, um, I, I couldn't move them. They had no weight to them. And when you when you work with a sigh, there's like a twirl and there's a way in which you move it. It has to have a weight to it. It has like a counterbalance, kind of like, you know, like you see those old martial arts films and it's like they balance the knife and the knife is perfectly balanced. And it's because of that, that they can like grab it and then throw it. And that's what gives yeah. it its ability to be used. Well, sighs are the same way. 
So there were just all these extra things. And it was so funny because we were putting so much time into this fight scene that really was not important to the film. But everybody wanted it in the film. <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> and that was my book of swords. That was my book of swords fight scene. And it was probably the fight scene that we practiced the least. Because mm. it was one of those, oh, we'll just practice it when we get home. They'd be like, okay. And I'd be like, are we going to practice yeah. our fight scene? We're shooting into it. Uh, we'll fact practice it when we get back. You know? And then finally it was <laughs> okay. like, two days before. Yeah. So that that was Book of Swords. And then it took a really long time for Book of Swords to get edited because it was an independent. And I wasn't involved in any yeah. of that because I'm not an editor. <laughs> But it was very cool, and Kate I Allen, did end so up doing I'm, some independent films, mm, but mostly stunt work. Yeah. Okay. So before we head on to the last segment of this episode, I'm actually going to ask you two uh, questions from fans. Uh, first one being, okay. uh, Minzy forty, Minzy forty two asks when the success of mortal kombat 2 skyrocketed how much did life change for you during this period how did you feel how were people approaching you uh, considering the game to this day is one of the most well-received mortal kombat games well when mortal kombat became extremely popular like a few years after mk2 we were buried so much by um, Midway and uh, John, you know, they, they were like kind of instructed to detach themselves or separate themselves. And I, uh, I know that it changed my life in no way whatsoever is kind of what I'm saying. Because at the peak of the popularity, unless you were really out in the forefront actively talking about being in Mortal Kombat, Mortal Kombat as a company, as a franchise, had buried really who we were. So the only reason why we would get any um, uh, mention or notoriety would be because we met someone like you, let's say, Toasty. You know, someone just happened to have a relationship with someone you know, and then they would be like, oh, really? They're the originals? Oh, I forgot about those guys. Danny was a little bit more on the forefront because he was out there talking about it more, but I was already like in my life and in my career. So it actually changed my life very little. Um, I mean, I never, I never like picked up a student because of it. I never, I didn't open my business because of it. Um, I had no financial gain from it. So it's not like it gave me seed money to do anything in my life. It was just one of these things that then eventually was just buried all the way at the bottom of my resume because I was so busy building my resume up here with, to me, right. legitimate um, uh, credentials that I could use that were defining who I was as a person at that time in my career. But because the franchise really wanted nothing to do with any of us, for me, it didn't change a single thing for me. Okay. And uh, last Only but not recently least, because uh, of events. Very... Yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. Uh, our very good friend from uh, Nerd Cage Live, uh, Jay Saint, he asks uh, originally when you were working on the Mortal Kombat 2 game, was there any discussion at all for you to play uh, maybe another character other than the three you already have? Say, for example, Scarlet, etc.? No, no, we never really got that far. You know, I mean, once the game came out, then the whole um, kind of cease and assist and and everything um, started to happen. And they were already talking about, uh, honestly, getting rid of, uh, from what I remember, they were already talking about getting rid of most of us because they didn't want to pay, you know, you know, as our popularity would, let's say, in theory, increase, they didn't want to then have to deal with what they would owe us in the next game. It was all really just not cool. 
Yeah. But no even problem. by that time, they had sold the rights to Mortal Kombat. It, and my memory might be wrong, but at the time, when they started to, um, I believe, talk about MK3, they had already sold the rights to Mortal Kombat and our likeness to over 40 companies worldwide. From toy companies to, you know, mm. uh, play, uh, to card collecting, to clothing lines, to t-shirts, to, you know, all the different game systems. So they, I don't think they really, honestly, they did not care at all whether or not we were part of the project or not. So it had no impact for me because they kind of just erased us, erased me at least, from being part of the MK2 game, you know? Wow. And like I said, they started to make the characters a little less true to life in the movements. Mm. Well, thank you for clarifying that, Catelyn. So we are now going to jump into what is known as Final Round. So what we're going to do during this final round is ask you a bunch of uh, quick questions. So first one being, what is your favorite food? Okay. Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone always says pizza, and it seems to be a Mortal Kombat thing, honestly. What are some of your well, pizza secret was talents? a big part of the bribes. Secret <laughs> talents? I'm a, uh, I'm a pretty good Lindy Hop dancer. Oh. Okay. Wow. Best piece of advice you've ever been given? Been given or follow? <laughs> been given <laughs> okay so um well as a martial artist i live pretty pretty committed to lead, lead by example so that's always been one of our martial arts mantras and then as a practitioner of a martial art and 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 martial athlete um I think the best thing I've ever learned as a younger martial artist was you're only as good as your worst rep. Mm. So what that means is whatever your worst one is of the day, that's the best you'll ever do under pressure or on the street or in competition. So you, you have to come in to always improve your worst one, not your best one, because it's really easy to pull one perfect something off. It's really hard to make your worst one better. So that those would Absolutely. be probably the things that uh, I for sure it have impact me. Uh, tell us about your strangest fan encounter. <laughs> strangest fan encounter? Um, yeah. I mean, strange as in like, huh, that's crazy. Yeah, Not unexpected. strange as in they were, Different. yeah, like they were weird kind of thing. Um, I think the first time I saw somebody who had, um, I would say the first time I saw somebody who had the characters tattooed on their body, had the Katana ah. Angelina. I had never seen that was before. It? And that was at uh, a fan... That was at an event I did at a place called Galloping Ghost, which is an arcade here. Yes. Um, that he, really great guy, his name is Doc. He asked us to come out to his arcade to do just a promotion for his event. In any case, I had never seen anyone who <laughs> had a tattoo. Was it the uh, Mortal Kombat 2 variations to top that off? It wasn't. I think it was Mortal Kombat 3, actually. Okay, right on. Still, nevertheless, really uh, bizarre to see, I'm sure. I, I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd never even thought about something like that. <laughs> um, what was your very first job? I worked at a pet store. I cleaned the cages at an oh. exotic pet shop. Wow. And it had a monkey that would pee on you when you went into the back room. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. You'd have to walk. 
You'd what? have to walk into the storeroom with the garbage can lid because when you went in to go get things to stack the shelves, this spider monkey would stand up and urinate and try to hit you and you would have to like go behind <laughs> this lid. What was the monkey's name? It was awful. What was the monkey's name? I I don't know. He I don't remember, but oh, okay. I hated that monkey. <laughs> um, I really did. <laughs> Amazing. Um, what was the last what question? What is your favorite movie the of all one? time? I mean, it's hard to say all time, but I would say what I've watched the most, probably Empires mm. and Rocky Two. you know? Oh. I've watched more than any other, you know, movie and probably have, you know, in a way, I guess, impacted me the most, you know. Rocky Two was my favorite of the franchise. It was a great movie. Yeah, Rocky Two, Rocky Three are pretty, pretty awesome. But Rock, I mean, Rocky Two is, I think, from like a, an acting and script. It's you know probably, and it kind of, of its kind. Like Rocky Three was awesome, but Rocky Two is like really, really good. <laughs> and I've met a lot of people who have never seen Rocky before. It's crazy to me. <laughs> Unreal! Wow. And I, I honestly don't, mean don't know like, if I've seen them myself, so maybe I'm one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa, there we go. <laughs> I, I think, yeah, I think I'll have to do it now. I feel, I feel ashamed. Yeah, you have I'll to I'll hang my head in it. shame. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Um, what is your guilty pleasure? Um, I mean, wine. <laughs> nice. I really love red wine. Yeah. I mean, red I wine. That's something yes, that I like has red wine. Always been, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's kind of a last five, six years kind of thing. But when I was younger, oh, yeah. I loved um, peanut butter, uh, peanut chocolate peanut butter ice cream. When I was a kid, that was Ooh. my favorite dessert. Mm -hmm. Wow, nice. <laughs> and finally, what is the funniest thing that has ever happened to you? Oh my god! I don't know. <laughs> can't be that funny. We always save this one for last. Um, <laughs> Everyone gets stuck on these questions. I know. But, <laughs> see, you should have given me should have given me a warning because that's when you really have to search your mind for funniest thing. <laughs> oh man, guys! I want to give you a good story, but I don't have. I mean, I bet if I asked my husband, he would be like, "This is the funniest thing that's ever happened to you." <laughs> uh, uh, okay, maybe not funniest, but funny now that I think about that I did that. So I used to cover MMA in Vegas, um, yep. uh, UFC. I was a, um, a freelance yep. features writer for Grappling Magazine. So I would go to the fights. And that was oh. back when there were magazines and you would like follow and you would build a story over months. Okay. So, um, I didn't want to stop when I had my kids and I, it was, it was a BJ Penn fight and I was at the press conference. I had just had, um, my daughter, she was three months old and she wasn't being fussy, but I certainly couldn't hold the baby while, you know, asking questions to the fighters, right? That was kind of, would be weird. And <laughs> it was so cute. BJ Penn's mom came up to me and was like, do you need me to hold the baby? I was like, oh my God, can you just hold her while I interview your son? And I didn't know them. So that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things like that, that were really, really funny to me. And then there's, there's stories yeah. where I remember... I was working in Asia. My husband came with me and I was a huge pride fan, huge pride fan. And we were okay. huge Sakuraba yep. fans. I don't know if you guys followed um, MMA back then, but Sakuraba was just, he's amazing. He's just like so underrated and nobody ever talks about how amazing of an MMA fighter he was. So in any case, we were like, we're going to go to Sakuraba's dojo. We're, we're going to train. Or I was like, I'm going to train because my husband didn't train. And you're going to take right. me there and we're going to go and it's going to be amazing. And I got there and they would not let me walk in because I was a woman. So mind you, we went to Tokyo to do this 
I never thought in a thousand years that they wouldn't let me, but they would, they let my husband go in. So like, there's lots of funny things that like, believe it or not, we didn't, Wow. we laughed about it. Um, like there's lots of funny things like that that have happened. Like a lot of them, you know, instances where I've gone to do something and never even thought about, well, maybe I should see if it's okay. You know, I've, flown yeah. to Brazil to train and I wasn't allowed in the school because I was a female. Like, so I, I did it. I found, yeah. I mean, I just found something else to do. I mean, there's just all these instances, you know, like that where it's funny. I know it doesn't sound like it was funny, but you would think that I wouldn't make that mistake more than once, but I like made it a couple times. Yeah. Like you would think there were like three events. Oh, there was like, a Brazil thing, a California thing, and a Tokyo thing. You would think I would have checked before I went or would have learned from the previous time. <laughs> so we always joke As that if. I'm the most rejected martial artist in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. But wow. with no hard feelings, if that makes sense. No hard feelings over it. Okay. Okay. Well, Kara, so I wish I had something thank you funnier. so very much. You're welcome. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. It, that was great. That was a good answer. Uh, thank you so very much for being here today. Um, it's It's been an incredible uh, time, and uh, hopefully we'll chat with you again sometime. All right, my friends, and there we have it. The legend has spoken, and we now have a more thorough understanding of what occurred behind the scenes of Mortal Kombat 2. Be sure to follow her social medias and keep up to date with her incredible talent. This has been another memorable episode and we're happy to provide this all for you. We appreciate each and every single person tuning in today and for all the continued support. There is a number of people that me and Chris would like to thank for keeping this podcast afloat. You know who you are. We love this community, and it is astounding to see it grow and flourish. It is because of you guys that we keep doing what we're doing. Keep a sharp lookout. Kamidogu has many surprises in the near future. You know how it goes. Have fun, stay safe, and stay flawless.